thank everybody for coming this afternoon. My name is Fred Litwin. Noted author Fred Litwin. And of course, Fred is also the author of I Was a Teenage JFK Conspiracy Free, On the Trail of Delusion, and uh, Oliver Stone's Film Flam, The Demagogue of Dealey Plaza. Fred Litwin is here. He's a longtime author and certainly watcher of politics. Uh, joining us, uh, Fred Litwin, great to have you here. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening. Welcome to another edition of On the Trail of Delusion, You're the my online podcast where we actually try to separate fact from fiction, uh, the wheat from the chaff, and actually give you something substantive on the web rather than the usual conspiracy nonsense that is all over the place. So welcome to another episode. My guest today is Gus Russo, a good friend of mine um, and just an absolutely amazing investigative journalist. So let me tell you a bit about Gus. Um, for 30 years, Gus Russo has been an investigative reporter, author of nine nonfiction books, writer and producer of many national and international documentaries for major networks. His books have received Book of the Month Club and History Book Club featured selections, and five of them have been optioned for films. Uh, one of them, The Outfit, was a Pulitzer nominee. He's written three books on the JFK assassination. Brothers in Arms was his last book, The Kennedys, The Castros, and the Politics of Murder. Um, he's also written Where Were You? He is an expert on the JFK assassination. He was a major investigator for the PBS Frontline documentary on Lee Harvey Oswald. And so welcome to On the Trail of Delusion. Gus Russo, welcome to have you. Hey, thank you, Fred. Great to see you. Okay, so my first Speaking question... of On the Trail of Delusion, I have to show you the shirt I wear apropos. The, oh, the, flat, the flat Mars Society. Okay, right. <laughs> very, very appropriate. Okay, so my first question is, you know, what got you interested in the JFK assassination? Well, you know, uh, I'm old enough to uh, report that uh, I was alive when it happened. And uh, uh, if you went through it, especially as a, a Catholic, from a Catholic family, JFK was our first Catholic president our family worshiped the kennedys and it was a bit it was quite uh, a traumatic experience and there were some initial you know confusions about what happened obviously in the fog of war and all that and they kind of i wrote i write about this in the introduction to live by the sword some of the things that looked a little sketchy to me as a kid even but when the warren commission came out i think most people in fact i know most people pretty much accepted it i had this interest in it everybody you could not be interested in it it was an incredible event but uh, the Warren Commission, I don't know if you know this, Fred, but uh, when it came out, 80% of the American people actually believed it. You know, they bought the commission, the report. And I was probably one of them. But then a couple of years later, Mark Lane came out with Rush to Judgment, which really changed everything. As a young person, it never occurred to me that an attorney could write a book with all these misstatements and lies. I thought, it was, I thought it's got to be true. He wouldn't be lying about this, about the testimony of Jack Ruby or this or that. And, and the uh, the murder of J.D. Tippett. And I said, my God, this guy, you know, he, he's an attorney. He's got a real publisher. And it was a big bestseller. So that really got everybody going, including me. I was too young to do anything really firsthand, but I was reading the books, majored in poli sci. My career path was going to be music. I was a musician since I was 13 and I'm professional playing teen centers and all that stuff. And uh, I minored in music at, at college at University of Maryland, and I majored in poli sci. Uh, and after college, I moved to New York to be a musician, but I was always interested in the case. So some of the bands I was in at the time were touring bands, traveling all over pretty much the eastern half of the country, especially New England. So anytime I was in a town where there was some connection to the JFK case, that's where I became sort of a, you know, an amateur gumshoe. I would say, oh, Jim Hostie lives here. And I'd call him up, you know, and let's have, let's have lunch you know, the day after our gig, you know. So right. it was more of a hobby. Uh, but I was obsessed with, I, I felt, I think I learned early on that I had some ability to talk to people, probably because when you're a front man in a band, you learn how to talk to an audience and the rhythm of how to communicate. So um, it came naturally to me. Uh, so I was doing it like crazy. I was building up a database of, of people, uh, phone numbers and people all over 
FBI guys, um, uh, Cuban exiles, what a CIA, F, you know, whatever. And so um, along comes the, uh, I am still living in upstate New York, and then the House Select Committee happened. And I was really aimed to be on the scene for that as much as possible. So I would drive down or take a train down from upstate New York whenever they had an open hearing, hmm. a public hearing. And I was there for a lot of the big ones when they showed the Zapruder film, when they with the, when they did the uh, uh, sound, when they showed the uh, the, the, the acoustics, thing, the, the sound of the acoustics with the Zapruder film. I was in the front row, which was wrong. I snuck in because that was where the witnesses were supposed to sit. I sat next to H. B. McLean, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and you can see me in the footage of that day. So I was there. I got. I spoke to Weiss and Ashkenazi, who were. I mean, I was crazy. Uh, I, I'd speak to anybody. So after the thing was over, I took them out, went to lunch with Weiss and Ashkenazi and picked their brains because I didn't it, it didn't make sense to me. The whole static filled tape with uh, uh, all this uh, with alleged gunshots. Uh, and I gave them, you know, a bit of a piece of my mind. It wasn't very it wasn't, didn't go down very well with them. Anyway, mm. during that period, uh, I became friendly with Scott Malone, who uh, was a D.C. Uh, private investigator and, and reporter. He worked for the New Times Magazine and a few others, maybe Mother Jones, I can't remember. But we became friends, and he introduced me to a lot of the staff of the HSCA, uh, like Kevin Walsh and people like that. Uh, so I was part of that. It was a tighter community back then. It wasn't a thousand millions or whatever of JFK researchers. It was only a handful of us, and we all sort of knew each other um, and, and were very cooperative. We go over to Scott's house after hearings and hang out with some of the staff, and it was just a great time. The only reason I mention all of that is that that's how the Frontline thing came to be, because Scott Malone went from there to be the, one of the lead reporters for Frontline when the show started in the early 80s and stayed with them for a long time. So I continued my music work and my private investigations in 1988. I got a... a communication with from jack anderson who was doing a big special on the assassination who shot jfk and that was my first paid gig i sent him some of my phone numbers that i had for the show i was like a long distance connection i didn't i wasn't out in the field with it but i sent him my some files and some phone numbers and uh, that really got me interested in the documentary world i'm trying to get <laughs> to a front line and so that's my interest just by doing it for my own thing. It wasn't never intended to be a money maker or anything or a book or anything. It was just my I had to figure out right. what this what, was all about. What, what made you sort of skeptical of the conspiracy stuff that you were you initially believed in? Well, yeah, uh, the House committee, I was I was really impressed with and I met some of these folks when I was there, the um, the scientists who did the uh, the trajectory studies, the ballistic studies. I, I came away. OK, Oswald shot him. I knew that from the time of the committee. Done. He did it. But then there were big mysteries about what else was involved. You know, what, who did somebody get him to do it? Did somebody know he was going to do it? There was you have to understand that in the 70s and 80s, the CIA was the big bugaboo. You know, it, it, yeah. they were in the, in the 70s. It was all about killing foreign leaders, allegedly or trying to. And then in the 80s, it was all about drug running, uh, you know, working with the Contras. And uh, the CIA was just this evil empire and so the question was did they what did they know and what were they covering up about this even though oswald shot him in my opinion in my conclusion was what did the cia know about mexico what did they know uh you know about uh oswald allegedly being a uh, fake defector right all yeah. these things were swirling and it was all around the cia so that for me the rest of my time was spent not investigating oswald but investigating the CIA and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that gets me up to around 1991 or 92, uh, Scott Malone, who was still working with Frontline, said, Gus, we got to do something. We should propose a show for the big anniversary, 1993. And so we spoke to Mike Sullivan, who ran, who was the lead executive producer at Frontline. And he loved the idea. And uh, he gave us a little discretionary funds to travel around and put together a proposal, Scott and I. And uh, we put together after a couple of months, maybe three or four months, actually, Scott and I had a really nice proposal and we took it up to Boston for Frontline is headquartered. And Mike loved it. And he said, well, let's 
let's try to do something. And Mike was great. Uh, it wouldn't have happened, obviously, without him and without him going to England and getting the B. I think it was the BBC. Could be wrong about that. But he got uh, the Brits to co-fund it because it was yeah. what we were going to do was really expensive. Scott and I uh, proposed that we would just travel the world and f- and figure that we put more money in, into it than the HSCA did. I mean, it was a big budget. And they went for it. And I'm going, oh, my God, this is like a researcher's dream come true. I'm going right. to be well paid. I've got a ridiculous budget to go anywhere I want and interview everybody. I could fly in a day's notice. I could go anywhere. We, Scott and I started it. And the, the team expanded, obviously. We brought in Tony and Robin Summers, also known as you know, really indefatigable workers. When did you get the budget? Like how long did you have? A, how long of a time did you have to research the JFK assassination? You know, it... We started out slowly, Scott and I, before it got serious. And so it's hard to define. It was was almost two years, I'm sure. Wow. First was Scott and I, and then the team grew. And that was about a year, once, or maybe even a little longer than a year. It was crazy. It was, I mean, I didn't have to get permission to do anything. I just, I had a, you know, my own frontline credit card. If I wanted to go to LA to interview somebody, I just did it, you know, and and sent them the bills. And, uh, uh, they trusted Scott and I and Tony and Robin. I was going to say that uh, Tony's book, uh, Conspiracy, yep. was originally supposed to be entitled, if I remember correctly, was there a con- conspiracy question mark? And it was a book of questions to, in, in Tony's defense. It wasn't supposed to be he was saying it was a conspiracy, but he thought there was questions to be asked. It was well-researched. And uh, so Tony was on for a while. He and Robin, his wife, who's a great investigator and writer, they did great work in, in Russia for us. They went to Moscow and Minsk. They did all those interviews with the KGB. Uh, they went to Mexico City. Scott and I did all of the United States. Right. And, and Scott also went to Japan. I mean, Scott spent a month in Japan running down Oswald's connections uh, in the Queen Bee Club or whatever it was. Right. And, oh, man, that almost killed the budget because at the time, uh, the Japanese yen and whatever the, the exchange rate was such that if you went out for a dinner, it was $300, you know, and if you took somebody to dinner, it was 600. So right, right. frontline was getting all these receipts for, Oh, he bought somebody an apple for $20. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, but that's the kind of money they were willing to spend. We came back from Japan with nothing. Right. From, I mean, 10, $20,000 must've gotten spent just in Japan, but we were committed to to do things nobody else had done and run down everything and that's what people don't understand about that show they think oh they set out to stay out well did it we were talking to everybody 99 percent of whom didn't make it into the final film right right but once we realized that it was oswald that's it. mike said okay that's our show we started out without saying that we said let's look at everything and see where we land well that's where we landed you know. it's, it's, I'd like to, uh, and in a future show, I really do want to talk to Anthony Summers about where he now stands on the. J- he's jettisoned oh. a lot of uh, a lot of stuff about the case over the years. Yeah, he should be spoken. He, he, he spoken to. You know, it's same with. Well, I think the book he, the title he originally wanted was called "Not in Your Lifetime," which was his fault, which he eventually used yes, for his yeah. republishing. But that's what he really wanted. But the publisher said, "No, conspiracy is the way you're going to sell a million books," and you know he was right. Uh, same with Posner, with Case Close. That was the publisher's suggestion. I think Gerald told me, I could be wrong about this, that he thought it was a little arrogant to say Case Close, but the publisher said, no, 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 you'll sell 10,000 more books with that title. So, you know, right. I, I could be wrong. Gerald will correct me if I am, but I, I remember him telling me that. So the publishers have a say in how these books are marketed, and and it does affect the, the writer, you know, uh, the author. Um, he's got to present it that way at that point. That's how we did it, uh, and uh, and we interviewed so many people uh, who didn't make the show, uh, and those are some of the funnier, crazier stories. Uh, behind, we yeah. should do a behind the scenes uh, front line. Well, well <laughs> let's go. I mean, we should let's talk about. I mean, it was it's a terrific documentary. I mean, I really I've watched it many many times. And, oh, thank you. You know, it, it's you know what what always strikes me when watching something like that or reading your books, for example, is that it's it's real history as opposed to the, when you read a conspiracy book, it, it reads differently because it's, 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 it's full of, of conjecture and nonsense. So it's always a, a pleasure to read real history. 
Oh, uh, well, thank you. Yeah, or, we or watch try. a real documentary. Well, you know, I was sort of trained by some of the best people. You know, I worked with Cy Hirsch a lot. I, I worked with Tony Summers, who's a hard worker at Ren Robin. I worked with Frontline, which is won every award you can win. They sort of gave us our marching orders and they told us, hey, here's how you do it. Here's how you corroborate. Uh, who else have I? Uh, Jack Anderson, who was an award winning uh, columnist uh, in the U.S. here. Um, and these, I was fortunate, you know, having the connection to D.C. that I had. I uh, uh, met a lot of really you know, great reporters and investigators who sort of brought me in um, to that world. Um, I was just doing it as a hobby. I just, you know, I, I'm sort of like a Forrest Gump in a way, you know, my whole right. life. And uh, uh, so I just stumbled into these characters in D.C. And uh, they said, OK, here's how you do it, you know, and, and so I did it. And I, I, the other thing I like is, is the documentary is, is on Lee Harvey Oswald. It's not focusing on, you know, the, the medical evidence or, you know, there, there's this evidence of sh six shooters and it's, you know, the, 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 all that crazy nonsense. So that, right. It's, 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 it's very, very interesting. So tell us, you know, what are, what are some of the crazier stories from that time? I mean, you, you met all, all sorts of characters. I mean, for instance, oh my uh, God. Oh uh, Tosh, my God. Tosh Plumley, for instance. Uh, <laughs> you know. Tosh, Tosh Plumley. Yeah, I met Tosh before Frontline. Um, I mean, I was one of the early ones. Maybe Gary Shaw was on to him before I was, but uh, Tosh is a character. I, the way I got into him was, again, my DC connections. I think that Scott had introduced me to a guy named Jonathan Weiner in DC, who was the, lead, the chief aide to Senator John Kerry, later became Secretary of State. And they were fascinated with all this CIA uh, drug running stuff. And he, he, Kerry did the Kerry report. He worked on the Iran-Contra report. The CIA stuff in, in Central America was the big thing. In right. fact, we all, we all had read this book. I pulled this off the shelf. Do you, do you see this one? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 And this around. was like all about the CIA and a lot of drug smuggling, 1981. And uh, this is the first place Plumley's name is mentioned. Uh, and so when you mentioned you wanted to speak about him, I, I remember this. Anyway, I think Carrie's office must have read this book, and they read everything. And so they deposed Plumley. At some point, I got a call from Jonathan Weiner. Said, "Do you want to come down to Washington? Uh, Senator wants to meet with you. We have somebody who mentioned the Kennedy assassination during all of our interviews." And maybe you're the guy to talk to him. So that's where I learned about Plumley. So I spoke to him. I called Plumley. He lived in Colorado at the time. And uh, he had the wild tale that you can look up. Everybody knows about flying an abort team into Dallas on the morning of the assassination. He had a long history, allegedly, of uh, helping the CIA run drugs. And, and he was involved in the Bay of Pigs, supposedly. Just everything. And uh, it got so intense with him that, you know, it, and... I don't want to say yet unbelievable, but just off the wall kind of stuff. I brought him to Baltimore where I had just moved back to Baltimore from New York around 1989. And I, I uh, bought him an airline ticket. I said, let's hang out for a few days. So he came to Baltimore and he hang out. He hung out with me for three or four days. And uh, I didn't know what to make of it. He, um, he had no corroboration for anything. He came across as a little sketchy. I learned a lot more later when I got his FBI file that he was arrested many times for forgery and fraud. And and he had this flight plan that he gave me of the trip to Dallas, which is probably in my papers at Baylor. I don't even have it anymore, but it was everybody's name who was on the plane, you know. Including Johnny Roselli. <laughs> yeah, versus Johnny Roselli. And I think Arcacha, crazy things. Uh, our teammate, I can't remember all the names, but they were names he, who would he, never... E. e. Howard Hunt eventually was one of them. Uh, e. Howard Hunt on the plane, too. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, um, a couple of, okay, so we do the Frontline show. I didn't even utilize Plumley, that, but skip over that. A couple of years later, a friend of mine from 60 Minutes, a producer, wanted to interview Plumley. So, because uh, he wanted to do something explosive on the Kennedy case. So I brought him, I brought, him and this lady friend of mine, Liz, uh, and this producer down to Miami. We all flew to Miami. He was going to set us up with all these Cuban exiles. And we were going to do extended interviews with Plumlee and get all the details once and for all. I still have about four or five hours of videotape of him in Florida uh, telling us his story. Uh, to cut to the chase, it went nowhere. Right. Uh, uh, there was, you know, it was a, that's the other thing you should know about that 
era was a lot of wasted money <laughs> traveling <laughs> around interviewing people who had n ended up having nothing. But um, Plumlee was just one of many. Uh, I should point out that uh, one of the big things that got everybody interested in the CIA and drug running was a frontline show on the CIA and drug. It was produced by Olivia Wilde, the actress. Uh, her mother and father produced it. Or I know her mother did. She was a reporter for Frontline, uh, Leslie Coburn. So they had gotten into this whole nexus from which Plumlee came. And um, but I can't. It's hard to remember any more deal, details than that. Other than well, uh, oh, I remember. I do remember one detail. He showed us. He said he was on the South Knoll. Right. Yes. When the assassination happened, right. <laughs> so uh, we got pictures of the South Knoll, and there ain't nobody there. Right. <laughs> it's crazy well it's amazing that he's now in 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 rob reiner's uh, podcast oh sure Central. yeah it's like it's a new thing yeah. rob thinks it's new it's only like 30 some years and, old and uh you know one of the one of the one of the allegations was that uh you know he Plumley was at Nags Head, North Carolina. Oh, that's the other one. Yeah, with, yeah, of course. With Oswald as part of this false defector training or whatever. Oh, it was the illusionary warfare. School. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and in fact, I got the memo, I think, that Mike Sullivan wrote for, for you guys. Uh, with oh, you did guys. you? Yeah. I published that about uh, there was nothing in Nags Head. There's no facility in Nags Head. You said Mike Sullivan wrote a memo? Or I think so, else? yeah. Or was, or was it to Mike Sullivan? But there was a it memo. It was probably two. Uh, oh, could you send me that, please? When, yeah, when you, yeah. It's uh, a great memo. Basically, that, that there's there was there's nothing in Nags Head. There's oh, we no ran facility. that all. Yeah, we ran that all down. We even knew Os where Oswald was at that date. I think he was in Minsk. You, you know? know, I mean, I mean, just incredible story. And and uh, but there it is in Rob Reiner's podcast. Don't get me started on uh, the Rob Reiner show. Yeah. Oh my God, we'll be here for a year. Well, the other another character like like Tosh Plumley is a, a Gordon Novell. You know, Gordon Novell is another sort of character who has all these stories. Uh, oh, yeah, also... I knew Gordon. I knew Gordon. He called from time to time. I met him in New Orleans. Uh, and, uh, yeah, same things. It's a good analogy. Uh, a lot of stories, no evidence, and and a lot of ways to disprove it. I, I can't remember all the details these years later. I do remember he sent me a patented invention of his, a car engine that runs on water. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, of yeah, course, I mean... that... That never happened. <laughs> Gordon, what a character! <laughs> he was doing all sorts of stuff like that, and and, and uh, wow, we were, I mean, but again, I mean, people believe him, you know, and and uh, know. there's Richard Case Nagel is another one who yeah. told all sorts of stories. I mean, for some reason, you know, the J, these JFK researchers are skeptical about everything, but these guys come along with these ridiculous <laughs> stories. Oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> The hobo, the fake hobo. Oh, Chauncey, Chauncey, Chauncey Holt. Holt. Oh, I was dealing yeah. with Chauncey Holt. God, there was one after another. Oh, Thomas Beckham. Well, that gets oh, a whole other Beckham, story. Yes. Yeah, Scott and I went down to Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. What a great character. I mean, if you can, he's a fraudster, and he has a sense of humor about it. He just thinks it's the biggest joke in the world that everything he does is phony if you when you catch him on it he busts out laughing oh you got me that time gus <laughs> yeah just to tell our audience i mean thomas beckham was a character out of new orleans uh who basically early days he was sort of a musician and that didn't go anywhere but he decided to he was sort of into uh, being a con man <laughs> and so he would put on a concert some famous star is coming and of course Ricky he Ricky Nelson, he would bring in a Ricky Nelson. He'd bring a, somebody named Ricky Nelson. <laughs> right, somebody named Ricky Nelson and just rip off all the money. And, um, and uh, or for a while he wore a priest outfit uh, trying to raise money for Cuba, which he pocketed. Um, so he had a history, and of course he got entangled in the Garrison investigation. And the funniest thing is he testified before the Garrison grand jury. You could read his testimony online. Mm -hmm. And it's hysterical because, <laughs> first off, he's claiming he has all these degrees, you know. So I got a PhD in, in anatomy. Well, he does. From, I, I saw all those yeah. degrees in his storefront. He does you know, have Harvard, Yale, you name it. <laughs> you know, he's making it all up. And at one time they wanted to ask, they asked him about the precept, well, what, what denomination are you? And he, he, he couldn't answer the question. I'm not really sure what, den what, what denomination, you know. I'll have to look it up when I get home. Well, the, the important thing about Beckham is that, you know, there was this rumor going around in the 80s that there was a confession tape and, you know, yeah. with the HSCA. That's what got us interested or me interested. And uh, I mean, I got to such a point with my craziness and, and that I found a way to get a hold of some of those HSCA tapes long before this stuff was all released. Uh, don't even ask me the details. But I heard the confession tape long before anybody outside of the committee. 
And, uh, and so I said to uh, Mike Sullivan, I said, well, this guy's telling this wild story of uh, knowing all about the conspiracy in New Orleans. So he said, go down and check him out. So we, Scott and I flew down to <laughs> Louisville and it, we, we had a great time. I mean, it was a, another big waste of money, but we had a blast with this guy. Uh, <laughs> his, uh, his little storefront it was like on Main Street or whatever it was in downtown Louisville. Uh, with the whole wall was every wall was filled with fake diplomas. He was trying to sell me some. Gus, where do you want to graduate from? He had <laughs> Harvard rings. <laughs> you want to graduate? You want a Harvard classroom? <laughs> and, and then he tried. And he was a musician, right? Or he thought you know he played guitar. And he said, "Yeah, I wrote that song from a jack to a king." I said, "No, you didn't. I knew who wrote it." Right. <laughs> I said, "No, I'll tell you who wrote it, Tom." And he said, "Oh, you got me." We bust out laughing. So we got out the guitars. Somewhere there's a tape recording of me and him jamming for most of the afternoon because well, when he testified, and he actually he tested after he told the, that crazy confession story, they actually deposed him. Uh, the HSCA deposed him, and he told the the HSCA that he had he had more degrees than a thermometer. Well, he had them <laughs> laughing, didn't he? I mean, they were <laughs> once these once they, once they got onto the degrees. And he was saying, "Well, yeah, you know, I, 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 I could practice uh, surgery and whatever, and I'm, I'm a brain surgeon." And and then they realized, "Okay, this is this is we have to end this interview because it's just nonsense," you know. <laughs> and that was the end. They realized it, but yet he goes on, and Joan Mellon bought all the stories. Oh, and I made, know. It's just, made him the central character in her book. It's crazy. Uh, he uh, he signed some audit, some pictures for me. I, I think at the time he was gone by the name, name Wade Hampton. Uh, and uh, I've still got those pictures somewhere. Uh, he showed me the Ricky Nelson poster, right. and it was great. It, it, it showed uh, uh, sort of a blackout image uh, profile of a guy playing guitar. You couldn't tell who it was, but all around it had all Ricky Nelson's hits, tra Traveling Man, all the different hits, and it said, hear him sing all the hits, and, and he did sing all the hits, but it wasn't the same Ricky Nelson. Well, and, was and some fun what's, times. what's interesting is he had for a while. I had, I, I put on, I have on law. I, I found in the files, uh, Bob Lavender was this guy who was, a, mm -hmm. I guess, a print manager, ran a print shop in Seattle, was his manager for a while, and Bob Lavender was the guy who was sort of, I guess, maybe introduced them to Fred Chrisman, because mm -hmm. for a while Chrisman and uh, the, another con man, Chrisman and Beckham were working together as a con. Right, a variety of schemes, and then a Chrisman, of course, was also the target of Jim Garrison. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it just it, the whole thing gets so crazy, right? It just, it just, you you can't make this stuff up, and yet <sighs> people still talk about these guys. Yeah, I know it's it's amazing they're still talking. When I saw that on the Reiner show that he brought up Plumley, I said, "Oh my God, where's this guy been?" You know. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. so, so, getting back to to, to to frontline. I mean, you have a lot of crazy stories, but it, but you actually you did an amazing amount of work, and and tell us, of course, everything led back to Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. And so, so tell us a bit about Oswald and what you found out, and you you, know, you, you talked to everybody from I'm sure the Ruth Payne to you. Oh you yeah, know. we filmed we filmed Ruth, we filmed everybody. I spoke to Jean de Mornchild or Jean, I can't remember how she pronounced it, but she was ill. She was in California at the time. We wanted to get her on the show. Uh, now, we spoke, like I said, 90% uh, or more of the people we spoke to didn't even make it on the, the show. Uh, there was just not enough time in the world. But we wanted to, I mean, I, we were on fire. I was doing eight interviews a day sometimes. I mean, right. it was, just, and Scott was off doing his, and we were filing reports. Um, it's crazy. But um, we interviewed, from, for instance, Jay Walton Moore, the uh, CIA guy who lived in Dallas, who all these conspiracy notions were about him running Oswald or some nonsense. And he was a great guy. I interviewed um, another guy who didn't make it on the show, Ed, Ed Walker, Edwin Walker. I interviewed him well, on the phone. I interviewed him. I didn't right. go to his house, but uh, it didn't work out because he was kind of out of it. Uh, there's a funny story there, but you don't have time. Um, uh, I interviewed Walker. We interviewed just about everybody. We Nobody was off limits. You know, we gave everybody the opportunity to make their case. And um, I'm trying to think of, uh, I'm looking at some, I scribbled down some names here. Uh, oh, John Thomas Mason, the Oswald lookalike. I spent an afternoon at a barbecue with him. Great guy. What he was not. You know, well, Charles Steele, who handed out the, uh, the, the pamphlets. We interviewed Charles. He didn't want to go on camera. Uh, uh, one of the tramps. Uh, we, right. we found out who the tramps were before it was made public, I think, because... Jim Lavelle had been 
keeping those police records secret in his own house. And I was good friends with Jim. And he said, Gus, I'll tell you who the tramps really were. He brought down the file. I think one or two of them had passed away. I interviewed the family of one. One was in Florida. And they described the whole thing. Oh, yeah, they just a bunch of friends got together once a year and they would ride the trains. And, you know, and the family had no idea that this guy was mistaken for E. Howard Hunt. They said, really? <laughs> <laughs> My father was E. Howard Hunt. <laughs> so uh, we ran down the tramps. And, we, and then they never made it into the show. We never even talked about it because it was a waste of airtime. Yeah. How about, uh, uh, can you tell us a bit about the, the picture of David Ferry in Oswald? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was pretty much living in New Orleans during that show. I was back and forth so much. Uh, that was one of my main territories, New Orleans and Dallas, with side jumps everywhere. Um, and um, one of the first people I went to see was Colin Hamer, uh, who was in the Civil Air Patrol with Oswald. One of the first people I think I spoke to down. No, no, it was Ed Butler first, at Inca, and then Colin. So I went to the library, the New Orleans Public Library, where Colin worked, and I, I walked up to the third floor, and there he was in the uh, science division or whatever he was in, and he was a very nice guy, and he said, "Yeah, I'll be happy to talk to you about." Yeah, I remember Oswald, and 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 so we spoke, and uh, he said, oh, "You might want to go down to the first floor. Carlos Caroga's wife works down there." I said, "Okay." <laughs> And then I went to see Carlos Caroga's wife, and and she set me up with Carlos. And also, there was a third person working in the library. This is my first day on the job down there. And I'm thinking, this is really a small town. <laughs> you, know, you, you spend a day there, and you meet everybody. You can see how, and right away, I could see how Garrison could create any conspiracy theory he wanted to, because everybody knew everybody. You know, it was a really small town. And this is in 92 and 93. I can only imagine how small it was in 1963. And, and of course, everybody was running from Garrison to the FBI and from the FBI to the Garrison. I mean, back and forth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, you know, amazing. The other thing I did, and so Colin, speaking of the, the getting back to the photo, again, yeah. this is, I can digress forever on this stuff, but uh, I started talking to, I, I had the FBI report of all the uh, Civil Air Patrol guys with who were with Oswald at the time and allegedly Ferry. There's an FBI report that names them all. And I looked them up and called them up, knocked on their doors. And I must have spoken to a dozen of them. And it became clear some they didn't want to talk. They were still in fear of being involved in this story. The Garrison thing is really strange. Um, people don't know that a lot of people who were connected to Oswald in any way were living in fear of the terror of Jim Garrison. You know, I don't want to talk to you. Is Garrison involved in this? Oh, geez. You know, when I called Sergio Arcacha Smith. First thing, do you work for Garrison? I said, no, uh, uh, Sergio. In fact, I think he did Garrison just die at that point? I can't remember. I said, no, we, we don't work for Garrison. I must have said that a half dozen times to people when I called them up. They were nervous about this guy. So the Civil Air Patrol kids, who were adults by this point, they um, they were the same way. Some of them didn't want to talk because of Garrison. And I convinced some of them eventually. And they said, well, okay, being you're a good guy, you're not working with Garrison. Yeah, Oswald was there, one of the bivouacs. <laughs> And uh, we, we did have a picture floating around and blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, I said, I got to get the picture. We leaned on them and kept asking them, well, I don't have it. I'm, I'm sure some of them had it. Some of the ones who said they didn't. Uh, and uh, why? Well, another guy said, I had it, but I destroyed it, you know. Um, and uh, when Garrison came on the scene. So it was hard to track it down. Eventually, it led to a guy, uh, John Ciravolo, I guess, is, is something like that. And I... When I found that out, I called the people up at Frontline because Ciravolo, I, I don't care if he wanted to be paid for it or whatever, we weren't allowed to pay anybody. So I called Mike Sullivan and Ben Loderman was another one of our lead producers on this project. And then Ben contacted Ciravolo, who wasn't living in Louisiana at the time, and he made the deal. I don't know if it was, we got it for free. I still don't know the details on that or whether he paid him something, but uh, they made the final thing to get the photo based on what these CAP guys were telling me in, in uh, New Orleans, uh, that he had it. Uh, so that's how it, it came about. We even had a big press conference at the National Press Club in D.C. about that photo and about the fingerprints on the rifle that we had uncovered that had the, that this, the Warren Commission never saw. We got them from Rusty Livingstone, the cop. He sent us the uh, the, the his original high definition photos of the prints on the trigger guard, fresh prints, 
and we had the HSCA fingerprint of Scalise. We hired him to look at them, and he said, this is unbelievable. If I'd have had this to the HSCA day, days, it would have been great. But uh, so we had this press conference where we announced the photo. At the same time, we didn't pretend that the photo meant anything. We said, here's this photo that the HSCA had been looking for. There's Ferry, there's Oswald. Everybody in the photo said that, and we interviewed them, said that uh, Oswald and Ferry never had any communication. You know, Ferry was only there by a fluke. He occasionally went to these bivouacs. Oswald only went to one or two meetings because his mother wouldn't let him. And she eventually completely stopped him from going. So he was rarely there. It wasn't like they were Civil Air Patrol buddies. Yeah. They just happened to be there at the same day, had no interaction. And we said that at the press conference. It was kind of weird because we said, we got this breakthrough photo but it doesn't mean anything. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think I think uh, even uh, John Cervolo said that he doubted that that uh, Furry would have remembered him, and he took the picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I went out to Moissant Airport and interviewed Ferry's friends there and a bunch of people. And yeah, we 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 ran down the Ferry story really hard. And obviously, there was nothing there. Um, and um, I spoke to our Sergio Arcacha. He became a really good friend. He he was in Miami. And he opened up a lot of Cuban exile doors for me. And he told me all about Ferry. And it was a consistent story. You know, he was just a victim of Garrison. And uh, uh, the whole thing was that Garrison came up with was fantasy. And it destroyed a lot of people. That's, there's a sad part to this. I mean, I'm convinced that Garrison is what caused Ferry to have a stroke or, you know, whatever it was. Um, uh, and uh, Carlos Bringier's wife had a miscarriage. From the stress of all this, Clay Shaw, uh, David Ferry died. Uh, Clay Shaw eventually died after the from the stress of all this. There's a there's a lot of trail of bodies behind Jim Garrison. Ar Ar Arcacha lost his job in. Uh, Arcacha in lost his job. Oh, it was just he was a, a sick guy, Jim Garrison, and um, he destroyed people's lives. Not even connected to the Kennedy case, he had a history of indicting enemies and destroying them. Um, you know, and I asked, I think it was, uh, Le, who was the musician? Uh, Leighton the, Martins. Leighton Martins. I asked Leighton Martins. I said, well, why did you people keep voting for him, for for Garrison? And he and, and Al Boboff, they said in unison, well, he was good entertainment. He was colorful. You know, I said, great, you know. Uh, but um, that was their excuse for electing this guy to DA. But he was a bad, bad guy. I never saw so many people harmed by one guy at that point in my life. Uh, <laughs> And um, so, so there going, you go. So going back to, you, you mentioned Leighton Martins. I mean, one of the things that fascinated me was that, you know, uh, for a while, Martins lived with uh, David Ferry. Uh, they were they were friends in New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, but you had a you had a meeting with, with Leighton Martins, Morris Brownlee, and Alba Boof. They were all friends of David Ferry. Um, can you tell us about that and their thoughts about Oliver Stone's JFK? Oh, well, they, 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 they laughed at it pretty much. I remember uh, I, I had more than one meeting. I had a lot of meetings with those guys. There's a photo in my first book with all of us having dinner. But uh, no, I spent a lot of time with them. I remember Leighton called me. They all went to see the premiere of it in New Orleans together, those guys. Right. And, and Leighton called me as they were coming out of the movie theater. And he said, it was unbelievable. He said, we didn't even recognize Jim Garrison in the movie. He said, that was nothing like him. It was, they, he said, we were laughing. It was so opposite of the truth. They thought it, you know, if it wasn't so tragic, it would have been funny. But yeah, I remember him calling me the night he saw it and said he was unrecognizable as Jim Garrison, you know, Kevin Costner as Jimmy Stewart, kind of, you know, uh, every man or whatever. Uh, that wasn't the guy they knew. Uh, so, and that was pretty much everybody's opinion down there. Rosemary James and everybody, they, they just couldn't believe what they were seeing. Yeah, they, uh, in fact, I remember that... Um, Harry Connick Sr. had met with Oliver Stone before they made it. He told me, he said, you know, they came to New Orleans, he and Costner and one of the producers, and they came to my office, and he told them everything. He said, you're crazy for doing this. Uh, uh, you're, you got it all wrong. And, and, uh, and Oliver Stone said thanks and left and did it anyway. I mean, he was well warned that, you know, that's the thing, that he was wrong about Garrison. Stone needed... Yeah, obviously, he needed a protagonist to hang this complicated story on, the Kennedy assassination. And so I can see in one way why he could do it through Garrison, but not through Garrison as the hero, you know, as the anti-hero. 
I understood as a, as a, having written some screenplays, you need that. You need a central character. And I think there's also a psychological thing. Oliver Stone is pretty much an outsider in Hollywood, right. uh, like a black sheep in a lot of ways. And he sort of likes that big, you know, I'm the little guy against all the big studios. And Jim Garrison was the same thing in New Orleans. He was the black sheep of New Orleans. Another of the other attorneys or, you know, people respected him. And he ident they identified with each other, I think, as being, you know, the white knight against all the big forces, you know. And uh, so I think there was some bonding over that between the two of them. And um, so, you know, Stone is very much like that. Um, he, 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 uh, he, he does controversial things and he's hard, it's hard to get his movies funded for, because of that reason. He can't, I don't think he's got anything big made in forever uh, and because, uh, you know, I think, the, I think the JFK thing helped him in the short run, but in the long run hurt his career. You know, I, who knows? But, um, you know, I could tell you a lot of stories about because I was down in, in Dallas and New Orleans when they were filming and uh, the movie JFK. And there's a lot of stories there that aren't fit for public consumption. Just right. not just not good stuff, you know. Uh, so so getting back to just uh, Sergio Arcacha Smith and uh, yeah. Carlos Bringuer and Carlos Caroga. Mm -hmm. I mean, those were three anti-Castro Cubans who were living in New Orleans who uh, basically were targets of Jim Garrison, who were sort of tr who was trying to put pressure on them to come up with stories about Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. And, and, and of course, Garrison painted Oswald as this right winger, uh, who Amazing. was putting on a, a fake act of being, a, being a, a Marxist. Yeah. yeah. So what are your, what are your thoughts about, you know, Bringier and Arcacha and, and, uh, Caroga? Well, these are people who came out of Cuba. These were Cuban exiles who hated Fidel with a passion. Uh, and some of them, not not Arcacha, but some of the exiles hated Kennedy because of the Bay of Pigs. Right. And uh, uh, I don't I, I, I know Arcacha didn't hate Kennedy. In fact, he was one of the few who knew that the Kennedys were their friends, not their enemies. The Kennedys to the larger exile community in Miami, especially uh, had abandoned them. They were traitors to the Cuban cause. Arcacha knew differently because he knew Bobby Kennedy. And was sort of in that uh, pipeline of information from he was actually feeding information from New Orleans uh, about Cuban exile stuff that was going on. He was helping plan the, the next invasion that was going to happen. They were sending exiles down to Central America to, to train. Arcacha was part of that pipeline. So he was very close to Bobby Kennedy. He went up to Hickory Hill a number of times. So the very guy that Garrison is after, one of them, uh, was actually pro-Kennedy working in this very secret operation. Uh, and he's accused of killing, you know, uh, JFK, which is ludicrous. And as you know, Garrison eventually thought Bobby Kennedy was in on killing his brother because Bobby right. Kennedy had Walter Sheridan spying on him or something. So did <laughs> did Arcacha give you the impression of being a gangster type uh, a person who would who or, or or a killer? Oh my God! No, just the opposite. He was the most uh, discreet, gentlemanly guy. Always dressed to a T. Uh, and wore suit, beautiful suits and ties, and he was a diplomat, and he came across as a as a diplomat. And no, 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 he, he uh, <laughs> you, you you have to meet these people to realize. And right away, all these theories go out the window as soon as you say hi to them. Uh, right. Arcacha and his family were just the sweetest family. His, his his wife and I met his kids, and they stayed friends for a while. Arcacha gave me boxfuls of his things. His family sent me things after he passed away. I mean, one of the things he gave me was. Um, I still have it hanging on my wall. It, there's a few pictures of me with him, but he he went up to um, uh, Hickory Hill when Garrison was after him. It's in my first book, Live by the Sword. Right. And he um, said, Bobby, will you help me get out of this? And Bobby said, it wouldn't be right for me politically to make a statement about a DA. And sorry, I can't help you. But he said, and this this did make Arcacha mad. He said, but here, please have this as a memento. And he gave him a PT-109 tie clip, which Arcacha <laughs> gave to me. And I'm kind of hanging on my wall here in a frame. So there were some hard feelings about that not being helped by the Kennedys. After all, he had done for the Kennedys. He knew the Kennedys hadn't given up on Cuba. And not all the exiles knew that. That's an important thing. Bring air. Uh, he may have been more right wing in terms of... Um, you know, thinking the Kennedys had abandoned them, but he was anything but, you know, an assassin or an Oswald guy. Uh, 
he introduced me to everybody in New Orleans, all the other exiles like Caroga and different people. And, um, uh, you know, he was just hurt by like everybody else. He was hurt by Garrison, you know, and, and um, now these were good people. And it's hard to communicate that to pe folks who won't go and meet people. You can't do it on the Internet. Right. Yes. And, and, and it's too late now because so many people are gone and the conspiracy theories just flourish. Um, and a great example is um, De Bruys, Warren De Bruys, right. the FBI agent. He was accused of all kind of cover up in New Orleans, right? And uh, about Oswald. And I uh, went down to meet with him. Great guy, just the nicest guy. And um, he said, uh, I, we had a great conversation about the whole case. And at the end, I said, well, I have to ask you, are you aware that you're accused of covering up Oswald? And, you know, it was a moment I'll never forget. He got real sad and he with he the whole demeanor changed. And he said, Gus, let me tell you, he said, you know, I'm an Irish Catholic. JFK was Irish Catholic. He said, I worshiped the ground he walked on. He said, we all did. Most a lot of the FBI's were Irish Catholics in those days. Um, and he said, I'd have turned over and a tear came to his eye. He said, I would have turned over every stone in this city if I could have found out who killed him. You understand? I said, yeah, I think I understand. I'm sorry to even bring it up. You know, really emotional stuff that you don't get online. Well, it, 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 it really is incredible how the conspiracy theorists will almost, uh, there's a whole cast of characters who are treasonous. You know, yeah. all these... Uh, FBI, CIA people, they're all, oh, they, they all hated Kennedy. They all wanted to kill him. Um, they're all guilty of treason without ever talking to any of these people and seeing, you know, what they, what they felt. You know, I went all over the Dulles thing, as you saw in my first book. I went to New Mexico and interviewed his sister and, and some other family relatives. And, it, and I went to Miami and interviewed his friends, uh, Dulles' friends down there. I went to the library in, in, in New Jersey where they had his papers. Uh, that's the complete opposite of the truth. The Kennedys and Dulles were as tight as you can be. He was like a grandfather to Bobby Kennedy. They looked up to him so much. That's why Bobby put him on the Warren Commission, you know, to protect the Kennedys' interests. And uh, Jackie and Dulles loved each other. They were trading James Bond books all the time. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it's just crazy. It's just as crazy as saying Arcacha was involved as saying Dulles was involved. I mean... And no, JFK didn't, in a fit of anger, fire Dulles after the Bay of Pigs. Dulles came in and offered to resign. And Bob Jack said, no, I need you. And but he said, no. The thing is, Dulles wanted to retire. Jack begged him to stay on for a while during his administration. So it wasn't like, I don't want to be fired. He, wanted, he, he would love to have been fired. <laughs> he wanted to retire. So he went in and said, Jack, you know, uh, you know, I was, I wanted to retire. This is, I got to leave. It, 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 you, I shall, I'll take on the blame for this and this shouldn't come on you. And, uh, uh, Kennedy said, no, don't do that, Alan. Eventually four or five months later, uh, when the heat was getting so bad, Kennedy said, all right, yeah, maybe you should retire. Yeah, maybe you should leave. Just read the oral histories at the Kennedy library from Dulles, from Bobby Kennedy about how congenial and, and gentlemanly the whole thing was. It wasn't like I hate Kennedy because he fired me. That's the complete opposite of what happened. Um, anyway, I could go on. It's it's ludicrous, you know. Well, you see the same thing with a lot of sort of uh, former CIA agents. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've talked to a lot of CIA people, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you see a lot of a lot of all of them are you know David Atlee Phillips, for example. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is how many books is he in where he's guilty oh. of, of killing? Uh, uh, being involved in the assassination. Have you ever seen the letter from his son? From no. Dave Atlee Phillips' son? Uh, Dave, I think oh. it's David Jr. He wrote a letter to I, I, I to Dale Myers. It, it's, I might have a copy. I think it's on Dale's website. Uh, where he says what this did to our family. This These crazy accusations. You know, speaking of interviewing CIA people, I, I joined AFIO, the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, which really ought to spark a lot of you know, conspiracy theories about me. But uh, the truth is, a CIA guy told me, he said, Gus, you know, you can join this organization. I said, how? I'm not an intelligence officer. They said, well, we have this associate member thing. Hardly anybody knows about it. If I sponsor you in, it was Ned Dolan. He said, if I sponsor right. you, you can join us at all our luncheons. I said, well, I'd be crazy not to. 
I'm, and I was the only journalist at the time who did it. Uh, so I'd go to these luncheons where three or 400 CIA guys, all the cream of the crop. In the 90s, they were all still alive. Shackley and Helms, Colby, um, uh, Nestor Sanchez, the case officer for, for Cubella. We were having lunch four times a year together. And uh, I did this as a journalist to get to know these people so they'd trust me to, to have interviews. And I did. I got interviews with all of them, some off the record. Uh, Ness Sam Halpern, he was part of this. For 10 years, I did this. Uh, and... Uh, we would go to Fort Myers uh, in, in uh, near D.C. and uh, beautiful big ballroom. And they even asked me to speak before the group. It was so funny. They asked me to pre present my first book, Live by the Sword, to the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, which I did. And uh, uh, it was so funny because I'm looking down at the tables and there's all these guys who know much more about this than me. <laughs> and I made a joke about it. I said, I think I opened up by saying, well, the good news is. I won't have to explain to you who Alan Dulles is like I do at a library. The bad news is you know more about it than me. And they all laughed. They were very good to me. They, they, they uh, uh, loved did, my book. Did, did anybody confess to you that they killed Kennedy? <laughs> <laughs> Privately? Yeah, I mean, off the record? There was confession line. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, Nestor Sanchez told me, among many people told me that Bobby knew about the Amlash operation. And at the time it was off the record, uh, Nestor's deceased now, uh, and uh, uh, a number of other people, you know, told me things that I could never use uh, at the time. Uh, who else? Um, Eldon Rudd of the FBI. You know, he was in Mexico City, right. and he wouldn't tell me anything on the record, and he told me a lot about Mexico City that I wish I could have put in the book, but uh, um, it let me know that I was on the right track. You know, one of the things I remember asking Eldon Rudd, was and he was in the American embassy as a legat, the FBI legal attache. And I, he was, he was out West too, maybe Phoenix. Can't remember. I called him up and I said, uh, you know, we're doing the show. And uh, he said, I, I don't want to be involved. I said, can I ask you one? Maybe, maybe it was a book. I was asking him for my first book. And I said, can I ask you one question? Yes or no. And I said, if I was to say in my book or in my writing that there was more to Mexico city especially regarding Cubans and Oswald, would I be right? He said, you'd damn well be right. He said, that's, that's all I'll say. And even that I couldn't print, but that, that let me know I was on the right track. Right, right. Very important. Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff you get that you can't use, but gives you the fire to keep moving in that direction. He wasn't asking for money. Like they always say, oh, they want to be famous. He didn't want to be famous. He wanted to be retired in wherever he was, Scottsdale or whatever. So you know, it had the ring of truth. One other person I should ask you about the CIA, uh, Bill Harvey. So did, did, did he confess to you or did you, did you know? Tell us about Bill Harvey. Well, he was deceased by the time yeah, I got right, really into right. this. But you, you uh, spoke to his widow, right? Oh, I, I spent two days with her at her house in Indianapolis. I think it was Indianapolis. There's so many cities I can't remember. But I think it was Indianapolis. Uh, uh, he, she was there, uh, C.G. Harvey, uh, his nephew who sort of ran the estate. Uh, she was wonderful. I mean, but she hated Bobby Kennedy, Oh, as did Bill. Uh, no doubt about it. He hated Bobby Kennedy. didn't hate Jack. He, and he wasn't a murderer. Bill Harvey wasn't a murderer. It's funny, in their big living room in Indianapolis, there was a stuffed mongoose. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I wish I really wanted to get this. I begged them for it. And it had a, a sash around it. It said Robert F. Kennedy. <laughs> 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 I, man, I wanted that. She gave me a, a copy of Harvey's, uh, his copy of the church report, which had all his source, his notes in the margins, which some of the pages I duplicated in my first book. Harvey had his issues. He was a drinker. Uh, he, like many CIA people, he thought Bobby Kennedy was way in over his head, which he was with these Cuban operations. He, there's an anecdote in my first book, Live by the Sword, where Bobby Kennedy shows up at the CIA station in Hempstead, the JM Wave. Bobby just shows up unannounced and uh, starts tearing uh, confidential or top secret teletypes off the machine, rips them off. And Harvey says, what the hell are you doing? And he said, I'm taking these out of here. And so these CIA guys are going nuts. You know, you can't do this. So that was part of the problem. Bobby and Bobby later admitted it. He knew he was, you know, in over his head with all this stuff. He didn't know about discretion and and how to run these things. And it made a lot of people upset because they had to follow his orders. And yeah, there was problems, but it wasn't like, let's kill Kennedy, JFK. 
it wasn't that kind of thing at all, you know. <laughs> Well, you know, look, in, uh, you know, in Canada, I mean, there's lots of politicians I don't like, but I'm not going to kill them. I mean, it's just... It's just... And, and they didn't dislike Jack. They, they had yeah. a big problem with Bobby. Yeah. Because you know? <laughs> he was the one going to CIA headquarters every day after work at the Justice Department. <laughs> and Dick Helms used to tell me all the time about... We used to walk into his car from the Afio luncheons, and he would just tell me horror stories about Bobby coming to the to the to uh, to Langley and just yelling at everybody and not knowing what he was doing, you know. And uh, they just sort of said, yes, Bobby, you know, yes, Bobby, because they worked for him, you know. And, uh, so, yeah, it was it was just like a Keystone Cops at, at times, you know. And the CIA didn't really want these operations. They were told to do them. You know, and you witnessed the fact that after the Kennedys were out of office, all this stuff went away. If the CIA wanted to kill Castro, they'd have kept doing it. This was White House stuff. Right, right. You know, and same with Eisenhower and the and that came Eisenhower. The White House ran most of these big operations. The CIA guys demanded what they called higher authority for any big operation because their careers were on the line. So they always got it. And very often the higher authority ordered it, ordered it. Eisenhower ordered Iran overthrow, Guatemala. I highly recommend to your viewers get a book called The Declassified Eisenhower. The truth about the golf playing grandfatherly Ike, he was really proactive, as were the Kennedys. And the CIA, their job is to follow the directives of the White House, whether they like it or not. And anyway, that's, you know, digression. But that's what you get from knowing these people. Okay, look, we've gone um, a little over an hour. I don't know, we're not going to get, we don't have time to get into your... <laughs> uh, the, the main crux of, of brother, brothers in arms, which is worthy, I warn you, <laughs> it's, which is fine. It's worthy of a complete show uh, on its own. Just briefly before we end this episode, can you tell us a, a bit about JFK's foreign policy? Uh, the conspiracy theorist would tell us that his foreign policy was one of rapprochement uh, with the Soviets and the Cuba. He was going to exit Vietnam. Um, he was going to bring in an, a new era of peace to the world. And that's why he had to be killed. So can you speak a bit to that? My God, where do I start? <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Number one, his rapprochement, the, the peace speech at American University, was aimed at Khrushchev. They were on good terms with each other. They actually respected each other a lot, witnessed what happened after the assassination, how destroyed Khrushchev was. Uh, and Khrushchev was put under house arrest. So all our hopes were gone. Kennedy was killed. Khrushchev was destroyed. Uh, those two, if they'd have lived and stayed in power, everything would have been different, I think. However, um, uh, Khrushchev, uh, Kennedy gave this speech aimed at Moscow. It was not ever aimed at Cuba. That was at, uh, called his bone in the throat. He could never, he and Bobby could never, you know, disabuse themselves of the uh, uh I don't know. They, they, they were embarrassed by the Bay of Pigs and it never left them. Castro traveled around the world after the Bay of Pigs was, you know, after he won the Bay of Pigs invasion. He traveled the world embarrassing the Kennedys, making speeches. They're Cretans, they're Cretans and Cre they're Cretans. And, they, and the Kennedys just couldn't take it. Um, so um, anyway, um, there was no rapprochement with Cuba ever during the Kennedy years. It just shifted from Eisenhower had the mob doing it eisenhower's cia and uh bobby got the cuban exiles he got a few cuban loyal cubans who were in on this uh to uh continue the operations and uh so what was the rest of your question uh fred beyond the uh, rapprochement well the the fact that you know it, i i think cuba is a main thing the fact that they they really were were, were very very dedicated uh they wanted to get rid of castro they did that was their their, their number one goal and that and that uh, conspiracy theorists misunderstand things like operation Northwoods right which really came out of out of operation mongoose right I was uh, the first person in my first book to write about it because uh, uh, as I was researching my first book in 1997 is when the Califano papers were released and Northwoods is in that cache of 200 uh, pages of documents or 300 I can't remember but uh, Northwoods was a part of it. I referred mostly to the part of it called Op Plan 380, which was a new invasion plan. 
Uh, right. And I talked about that, but I got, I, I think I was the first, one of the first people to get my hands on those documents. And, uh, you know, it had nothing to do with killing Kennedy. I mean, I just don't get the connection that they're making. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, same with, with Vietnam and all that lunacy. Kennedy uh, was a hawk. You have to understand, the 1964 election was looming, and the Republicans were going to use all this against Kennedy, especially Cuba and Castro, 90 miles offshore. And Kennedy had to show that he was strong on these things. And uh, hence, he was trying to remove Castro before the election, in my opinion. That's what it was all about. And um, with Vietnam, he put the troops in there first. He uh, escalated the whole thing. Uh, a lot of it, pressure was coming from his own father because there was the Catholics and the, 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 um, in Vietnam who were being persecuted. The, the monks were immolating themselves on the streets. And uh, this was a personal thing, too. But at any rate, uh, I called up Kennedy's uh, head of uh, SINPAC at the time, uh, or, um, or who was in charge of his Vietnam operation, Brute Krulak, Victor Kru Vic Krulak, I think his name was, Brute. And I called him up and I said, I got to find out, was he pulling out of Vietnam? You were in charge of it. And uh, he laughed. He said, Gus, how old were you when Kennedy was killed? I said, 13. He said, uh, well, you knew as much about what to do in Vietnam as we did. And he said, here's exactly what he told me. He said, on Wednesday, Kennedy was thinking of pulling out. On Thursday, he was thinking of escalating. Right. And on Friday, he was going to pull out again. He said he didn't know what to do. He, he, whatever the wind blew, uh, it was an intractable situation. Uh, once the first blood was shed in Vietnam, everything changes in warfare. It's called the tripwire effect because then you can't pull out. Because how do you justify these first dead GIs to their families if you say, oh, it was a big mistake and you pull out? You're caught up by that point. And once the tripwire had been hit, uh, there was no getting out of it. And it was one of the great tragedies of the 20th century was Vietnam. And Kennedy, um, and you know, I read a lot about it. I can't give you all the details in a short amount of time, but there is Thank no you. doubt uh, he was going to stay in Vietnam if not escalate. Johnson didn't want to have anything to do with it, but Kennedy's cabinet stayed with Johnson for a transition. And they said, oh, Lyndon, you don't know as much about politics in Asia as we do. Uh, and Johnson thought it was a bad idea. And they convinced him he didn't know what he, what he thought. And he said, okay, if, you, if, if McNamara and you guys know more than me, let's do it. And he regretted that to the day he died, that he kept Kennedy's cabinet. Because had it not been for Vietnam, his presidency would have been amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Vietnam destroyed his presidency, and it was Kennedy's cabinet who told him what to do. Uh, oh, it was it was tragedy on top of tragedy. We could go on for a year about that, you know. But anyway, um, what <laughs> I guess the the funniest person we should talk about before we go is uh, Fletcher Prouty. Yeah, yeah, I had one or two interactions with Fletch. Uh, I went to his house. I think he was living in Virginia. And uh, uh, it was one of those things that you didn't waste too much time on. You know, you may know more about him than I did. I mean, of course, he wrote uh, uh, his book, The Secret Team. So he had to be spoken to. But again, it's a guy with a theory with with no corroboration for any of it. His big thing was that milit that book, The Iron Mountain. Yes. Uh, thing, yeah, which, which, was, we, which he thought was real, and it was yeah. fiction. Yeah, it was fiction. It was it was uh, it was like a hoax. Yeah, it was a hoax. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. well, I think when I found that out, I said, "Okay, check, please." <laughs> I'm done, done with Fletcher Browdy, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and and interestingly, uh, as, as everybody sort of knows by now, it, that's the Donald Southern char character in X in, in JFK, the X character. And of course, Prouty never met with Garrison like that. That was all fiction. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, that's the other thing with Oliver Stone, that he bought on to that Fletcher Prouty stuff at all. It's, uh, yeah, $45 million wasted. On yeah, that. And, and, and I mean, Fletcher Prouty was, was a horrific anti-Semite. Oh, yeah, that's true. I forgot about that, yeah. I mean, my God, he, he was going, he was writing for, uh, I mean, he presented at one of the uh, Cardo, uh, the, the internet, the, the, one of the Holocaust denial conferences. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. 
Wow. And you know, and then and Mark then, Lane. Didn't Mark Lane marry Willis Cardo's daughter? Well, he was Mark Lane was also part of that crowd. In fact, yeah, Mark I know. Lane yeah. for a while was the anti-Zionist uh, uh, editor of one of the publications. Yeah. A, Jew a Jewish lawyer working for the anti-Semites. Crazy. Well, uh, I, I remember uh, going through uh, your papers at Baylor, and I've, I found a memo uh, uh, to Oliver Stone about Fletcher Prouty saying, you know, look, we have, we have an issue here. Oh um, yeah, you know there's stuff. I think that was in Jane Rascone wrote that yeah. letter, right? Yeah, she head of research was trying to warn him about yeah. that. Yeah, you know the, this is this is really serious. I've looked into this, and and it's actually yeah. true. You know, yeah. there's, there's, there's 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 it's really bad. Yeah, uh, and it, it was uh, that. I mean, I Stone hired me for a minute before I knew. I didn't. I never had the script. He wanted, but he he had knew my he knew my work for some reason, and. Uh, uh, no, actually, I had written him years before that he should do a Kennedy assassination movie back in '88, long we, before. We can blame you. I mean, it's yeah, blame me. I, I, I may have been the first person, <laughs> but oh I think God. he always wanted to do it. But he, he liked it. I showed the kind of work that I'd done. I wanted to write the script, and <laughs> he flew me out there. And, he's, and I thought my my day had come in. This is around 1990 or something, and I thought my my ship had come in. And uh, uh, he said, "No, no, I'm doing something different." He said, but I want you, I want you to help me because you, you know where everybody is. Uh, I had all these phone numbers. That's a great story. So he, I, I did hang around on the scene in Dallas and New Orleans. And if he needed to contact like Buell Frazier or somebody, I said, well, I'll call up you. I know him. And that was my connection to this thing. <laughs> Boy, there's a great story there, which we you don't have time for probably. But uh, uh, all the people who uh, Stone wanted to meet and the deal was he promised them dinner with Kevin Costner. That, that never happened. <laughs> Oh, Kevin got sick. <laughs> you know, <he> could, <laughs> There's so many great stories about that movie. We'll we'll talk about a whole separate hour sometime. <laughs> okay, that'd be great. Well, look, I think we're going to end it here because uh, going on to Brothers in Arms and and uh, yeah. Cuba and Mexico City, those are big topics, very important topics, uh, which I really want to get to because your stuff on Cuba is the best around. Oh, it's very so important. Much. Very important, uh, um, very important uh, part of the case that nobody really discusses, or I should say they discuss, but they get it all wrong. And, that, yeah, and, thank you for and, that. Yeah, uh, so, uh, I, it, it, was, it was so sad. They, did, they just didn't really read that book. They you know, just skimmed it. And, uh, um, and I'll give you, a, for the next thing, I will reveal uh, one, the name, the real name of one of our sources, the Oscar character, and uh, in, I'm uh, prepared to uh, tell you more about him. Uh, he was one of our great sources on Oswald and Cuba. He had the Oswald file. He was a G2 guy. And uh, there's a great footnote on what happened to him uh, and who he really was. So there's a teaser. <laughs> great. Oh, that'll be a great f uh, future episode when we really get into Cuba in a, in a big, big way. So, Gus, uh, thank you very much. Uh, oh, for, thank you, Fred. Always fun talking to you. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Yep. Thank you.